Genesis 15. A chapter in both of its sections which is seminal to the New Testament's doctrine of justification through faith. It begins with the words after these things, and we take this plain and simply to be referring to the battle with Kedarleoma, the battle of the kings, and the meeting with Melchizedek. Abraham's test. Genesis chapter 15 at verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what wilt thou give me? For I continued childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, thou hast given me no offspring, and a slave born in my house will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. And then he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord. And he reckoned it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me an heifer three years old, a she-goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in two, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when birds of prey came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, A deep sleep fell on Abram, and lo, a dread and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know of a surety that your descendants will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be slaves there. They will be oppressed for four hundred years, but I will bring judgment on the nation which they serve. And afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for yourself, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation, because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking firepot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I give this land. From the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Canaanites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. This is God's Word. Thank you. Before you at Genesis chapter 15, let me show you the two sections of the chapter. Chapter. 
doesn't divide evenly in two because the first six verses are concerned with Abram's faith. And here we find that Abram's faith is confirmed and also focused. But then from verse 7 right through to the end of the chapter, what you're looking at there is the promise of God sealed to Abram in covenant. And if I can put that in fewer words, verses 1 to 6, focused faith. Verses 7 to the end, the covenant seal. Now, in a fairly recent series of studies, I think they were at the evening services, but they were studies which we entitled Significant Verses, we came to this chapter and we took, quite rightly, verse 6 as one of those significant verses. And Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. In fact, as we saw, although this verse is vital to the New Testament and to its understanding of faith, being quoted three times in the New Testament at most crucial points, it is the whole chapter under both headings that carries the true significance. I think we saw that in our study, but we remind ourselves of that tonight. It is not just one verse, although that verse is seminal, but the whole chapter in both its sections that holds the significance for what the Bible has to say about faith and salvation. So tonight we come back to Genesis chapter 15, but we are involved now, of course, in a wider study and I hope tonight a wider application than on the last occasion. If there are two sections to this chapter, then there are also two reasons why the New Testament sees it as profoundly significant. The first is obvious. The first is that the statement that Abram was justified by faith, which finds its root in verse 6, is a phrase and a truth that belongs at the very heart of the gospel. Hence it arises, as we'll see in a minute or two, in Romans chapter 4, in Galatians chapter 3, at very vital junctures. But that's only one reason. The other reason that the New Testament finds this chapter profoundly significant is that it is this covenant rather than the covenant at Sinai with Moses, the covenant we call the agreement of the law that is fundamental to the gospel. This covenant and not the covenant at Sinai is foundational to the gospel. In other words, grace came before the law, not after it. It was grace that came first, and it was a covenant of grace that came before the covenant of the law. And if we are to say anything about the order of things in the Bible, then it runs grace, law, and grace, not as some people seem to think, law leading to grace. That's a way to misunderstand your Old Testament and therefore to place it beneath an importance, that of the new. And you must never do that with the Bible. The New Testament has no meaning without the old and the old has no fulfillment without the new. They belong together. It is the covenant made with Abram here that is fundamental to salvation. Now, I want to pin that down in two ways. Firstly, I want to show you that in the Old Testament, in the great series of episodes that prefigure salvation, 
That is, in the great act of God in redeeming his people, which prefigures the redemption that he brought to all his children through the cross of Christ, it is this covenant that is fundamental. Now, we're speaking, of course, about the Exodus. If you would turn with me very quickly to Exodus chapter 2, We find at the close of that chapter, its last paragraph, you see there, the rock upon which God's redemption out of Egypt was built. Just read from verse 23. In the course of those many days, here of course it's predicted as being 400 years or four lifetimes. In the course of those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned under their bondage and cried out for help, and their cry under bondage came to God. And here it is. And God heard their groaning. And what did God choose to call to mind? God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God remembered his covenant of grace given to Abram and renewed in the experience and life of the patriarchs. Now we said that that great act of redemption in the history of God's people prefigured redemption itself through the cross of Christ. And so it does. So that if you would turn with me now to the New Testament very briefly, in Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, this is the Gospel, remember, which begins with the great statements that lock the saving purposes of God into His redeeming work through history. We find there in chapter 1 that Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, was filled with the Holy Spirit. That's at verse 67. And he blesses God, and under the inspiration of the Spirit begins to utter the great prophecy of redemption. Now break into this at verse 72, and it tells us that God's purpose was to perform the mercy promised to our fathers. Which fathers? And to remember his holy covenant. Which covenant? Well, here it is, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham. So that redemption in Christ Jesus finds its beginnings in the salvation history that was part and parcel of the life of Abraham and in this great covenant which sealed his faith in God. That's why, by the way, when the writer of the Hebrews speaks of this covenant of God, he says that it was sealed with a promise and an oath. Now, do you see what I'm saying? That there are two reasons why chapter 15 of Genesis is profoundly significant to faith in God and salvation from our sins. One is because of what it says about justification by faith, and the other is that this covenant that comes in the second half of the chapter is the very rock upon which redemption was built. In chapter 17, God renews this. Do you remember? He says at verse 2, I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. And that's only one of the occasions which, in which either by words or deeds, Almighty God renewed His promise to Abram. But the fulfillment of that promise was not simply 400 years later in the exodus from Egypt. But of course, ultimately would be in the forgiveness of sins through the death of Jesus Christ. All of this, my friends, so that you and I should understand tonight why this chapter is so vital, so seminal, so foundational to the gospel itself. It's not so much the chapter as the truth that it contains and the promise 
which is lodged within it to be received by justifying faith. Therefore, Abram's faith must not only be confirmed by God as it is here, it also must be focused upon God and upon his promise. Now let me remind you that Abram's life as we are seeing is a journey. It is a journey of faith. It is a journey all the way with God and in another sense a journey to God. And also can I remind you that throughout that life journey, Abram was constantly tested. Sometimes the Bible in its complete honesty records his faltering under testing. He falters sometimes to such a degree that he seems to our eyes to endanger his own call and to threaten the purposes of God. It's almost as if he jeopardizes the promise of God through him for salvation, if that were possible. And yet at other times, Abram holds firm to the saving purposes and the great promises of God so that they are furthered in him and furthered through him. A bit like every Christian. A bit like every one of God's servants. Now, so far, Abram has been tested in several realms. He has been tested with the temptation to seek security in something other than God. Now, security must have been a vital matter to a man with no permanent home who lived in tents and only built altars. Under that test, he faltered. But yet, under grace, he recovered. And through grace, he learned a great lesson. That was chapter 12. And then he was tested in the matter of personal ambition. And he passed through that test safe and sound, as we would say, with flying colors. And that's chapter 13, where he learned humility. Or at least he shows real humility. But now, in this chapter, the testing is of a different magnitude altogether. And the testing is in a far more vital realm. In other words, here he goes through a test of faith and of trust. A test concerning the promise Firstly, the promise concerning his seed, his heirs, his son. And then secondly, a test concerning the promise about the land. And that again is the two sections of the book. A test about the son and the focusing of his faith in the first six verses. A test concerning the land and the covenant seal in verse 7 onwards. And he, Abram, must trust in God. Now, bear in mind that if we say that of Abram at this point, what we are saying is that he must trust in God, not for the next few weeks or months, but for 25 years. To put it another way, he must trust in God through the next six chapters of the book of Genesis. Because the fulfillment of the promise would only come when Isaac was born. And that fulfillment of the promise would lead to the greatest test in chapter 22. Take Isaac, your son, your only son, and slay him. And yet, taken in its context, this chapter that is before us tonight, as well as containing a test, contains confirmation. Confirmation from God and comfort. And the comfort also comes from God. Abram has been tried and tested as we saw chapters 12 to 14. He will be tested again as we will see in verses chapters 16 to 21. But now he is confirmed in his faith. And comforted in hope by God. Now God is like this. And it's a matter of rejoicing for my heart to tell you 
that God is like this. And we could select from the Old and New Testaments all the way through Various places that confirm that even although God allows us to pass through trials and temptations, nevertheless within them and through them, He is a God who confirms faith and comforts us in hope. From Genesis itself, do you remember the point at which Jacob, after his many twistings and turnings, decides that he must come home and face his brother Esau? And of course he is afraid. At that point, the book of Genesis tells us that God came to confirm and comfort him. It says this, Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met with him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's army. I could give you an example, not from the life of Jeremiah, but within the book of Jeremiah. From the experience of Baruch the scribe. Do you know, or do you remember, that in the book of Jeremiah, there's a tiny little chapter, a very short chapter, it's just five verses long, isn't it, which deals with Baruch and his fear. And there it's as if Almighty God, in the great purposes he is out working through Jeremiah's prophecy, turns to Jeremiah's secretary and comforts the poor man. He challenges him too and says, is it too little a thing for you? Is it too great for you? Yes. But in chapter 45 of Jeremiah, God turns to comfort the prophet's servant. Since we've mentioned the New Testament, we'd better pin at least one down. Do you remember Paul before the council? when he's moved out of a very dangerous situation into one that looks as if it's going to become worse, there's a violent reaction to what he is saying. And the people make plans to take him by force, and some of them swear they'll never eat again until they've managed to murder Paul. But we read in Acts 23 that the following night the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage. Because as you testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must bear witness also in Rome. And here it it is again. Here is God who confirms the call he gives and comforts those called in hope when they are scared. I do not know. I once counted, but I've forgotten how many I don't know how many times in the Scriptures from God Himself, from God Himself in the person of His Son, we hear the words, Fear not, do not be afraid. Let not your heart be troubled. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield Your reward shall be very great, but that's also perfectly, properly translated. I am your shield and your very great reward. And I like that because you know it is so personal. God is our shield. Therefore, our trust is to be not in what God simply supplies, but in God Himself. Here is a promise for you. I am your shield and your very great reward. Do you see, my friends, what I mean tonight when I'm saying to you that this first section is a confirmation and is also a matter of the faith of Abram being focused. It has to be focused on God himself. It has to be focused in a very real sense upon the descendant He would never see in the flesh, of course, upon God the Son in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. Because we see also, don't we, that the focus of his faith is the Word of God. After these things, the chapter opened, the Word of the Lord came to Abram. And although he struggles with it, what he is struggling with is coming to a focused faith faith in God himself and in the word of God. We saw in our studies that creation began with the word of God and God said, 
We saw in our studies beginning at chapter 12 that the history of salvation as salvation itself begins in the word of God. Now the Lord said to Abram, go. And that's why this great word in verse 6, he believed the Lord, takes us back immediately to verse 1. Now do you see that? You've almost got to look at the text to see it. You've got to look at the page of Scripture unless you're much more bright than me. But do you see that? He believed the Lord. It takes you back to verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram. Do not be afraid. I am your shield and your very great reward. That's what he believed. He believed God's word and he believed God himself. And God in his grace reckoned that to him as righteousness. And so we see, as Paul will tell us clearly, That Abraham, as much as you or I, could only be justified through faith in God, through trust in his promise, therefore in the fulfillment of that promise in Jesus. And yet, you know, it's important for us to realize that this was not easy for Abraham. That's why when the word of God comes to him in verse 1, the Scriptures, again with this searing, clear honesty, record Abram's struggle with the promise. He says in verse 2, O Lord God, what will you give me because I continue childless? You are repeating your promise to me. You are confirming me in the faith. You are seeking to focus my faith upon yourself. But what are you going to do about the promise you have given? Now, let's be clear about this. This is not Abram arguing with God. Nor do I believe for a moment that this is an occasion on which Abram is doubting God or doubting God's Word. I think rather this is the mark of a very real struggle going on within Abram to understand God's Word and also to apply God's Word. In other words, he does not mindlessly accept the comfort and the confirmation offered in verse 1. Yes, he wants to receive it, and he will by faith when he comes to verse 6. But he sees a difficulty. He sees something in himself that challenges this trust he must find in God. And he sees, therefore, the need to focus his faith. So he suggests what is obvious to him at that stage, that Eliezer of Damascus has to be his adopted heir. Is that the way, O Lord, you're going to fulfill your promise? And God says, no. So that we see that verse 1 is confirmation and comfort, but it's also more than that. There's a challenge there. Come on, Abram, take the next step of faith. A step into understanding a step into application of your faith. Now, it is very possible that this man, Eliezer of Damascus, I believe it's actually quite likely that he's the same excellent servant we'll find in chapter 24. And if he is, that would make it all the more likely, wouldn't it, that this could be God's answer and God's fulfillment of the promise. But Abram must focus his faith more sharply. No, God didn't promise you a substitute or a surrogate. He promised you a son. And the struggle of the chapters that are to come are a struggle with the promise of that son through Sarah. We know that. Focus your faith more sharply, God says to Abram. It's on your son, not upon your servant, that the promise will rest. Now, if the birth of Ishmael later was less of a mistake than this identification of Eliezer of Damascus and was more of an error or even perhaps a sin in Abram. Then it shows us that this nevertheless was a struggle to understand the promise of God. But as he struggles, he is heading towards the focused faith of verse 6. Verse 6. 
That's why, isn't it, that God becomes more explicit. Behold, verse 4, the word of the Lord came to him. Oh, you could almost say again, this man shall not be your heir. Your own son shall be your heir. And this is what leads the way to the further challenges of faith that we'll find in our studies if God wills in the weeks to come. But do you see Do you see how slowly, as far as Abram was concerned, how slowly, yet how sure and certainly God's purposes are to be fulfilled? My friends, very often when we learn to focus our faith, we must learn with it to wait upon God. But God's promises will come to fulfillment. Because of who he is. Oh, you know, it would be very, I think, very blessed for us tonight to look at the way now that we understand the struggle of Abram to find his way through to this newly focused faith is applied in the New Testament. Can I leave it with you? Read for yourselves what Paul says in chapter 4 when he quotes this verse. Uh, verse 6 at verse 3 of chapter 4 in Romans. Read for yourselves how he uses the same verse in a slightly different way, but for the same purpose in Galatians chapter 3. That's Galatians 3 and 6. And you know, don't you, that James uses this to bring together faith and works in James chapter 2. But all these things point to the fact that justification before God has always been by faith. From the very beginning. Salvation is by grace through faith alone. And do you see then how Abram's faith in God was a faith, you could call it propositional because he believed promises, but it was also personal. Because he didn't just believe promises, he believed God. And that's what it says. It doesn't just say he believed the promises. It says he believed the Lord. It's personal. I wonder if my faith is focused in this way as it should be. I wonder if yours is. I hope as the days and years go by that our faith will become more and more sharply focused so that it is propositional and personal. Believing in God. Focused faith. And now very, very briefly, the seal of the covenant that follows. You'll notice, as we've said earlier, but you'll notice that we move from one element of the promise now to the other. From Abram's seed, that is his son, to the promise of the land. You know, they both belong together because they both direct us to Christ in two different ways, but they belong together. But I want you to notice, if you will, that in verse 7, where God speaks again a word of promise and repeats his promise concerning the land, once more in verse 8, as in verse 2, Abram sees the difficulty and struggles again, not with unbelief, but again struggling to understand the promise, not concerning his son now, but concerning the land, struggling to understand and again to apply the promise so that the question what in verse 2 has become the question how in verse 8. And the answer is very simply in this covenant of grace. A covenant that will be given in two stages. The first here in this vivid demonstration, in this vision of the night and the day. And will be confirmed in chapter 17 when we come to the sign of the covenant, the circumcision of the male children. Now this covenant, which we saw as foundational to salvation... This covenant is sure and certain. 
God will achieve all that he has promised because he is a God of covenant. He is to be trusted. But before we come to that in closing, although the outcome of the promise is secure, it will not be easy. Now, never mistake certainty of the outcome in the promises of God for a guarantee that that outcome will come cheaply. Neither to Abram nor to those who inherit the covenant promise to this very day for you and I who are in covenant relationship to God through Jesus Christ, neither for Abram nor for us is this secure covenant an easy life. You might say, well, Abram's part in this was merely to witness it. No, it wasn't. There's another detail, isn't there? He must drive away the birds of prey. And do you think I'm being a bit fanciful if I say that that is a figure of opposition? The attack upon the covenant, the opposition to the covenant, the devil who must come in through the machinations of many people to try to turn aside. Think of those who are set against Jesus and who caused him to suffer. Think of those who claimed to love him and wanted him to avoid the cross. All trying to turn him away from fulfilling the covenant. God never said it was easy. The saving transactions with God are always made in the teeth of opposition. You better believe it. And your redemption, while it is sure in Christ, will involve for you various trials. And we must not think them strange when they come, as James tells us. And if you think that's fanciful, then all I need to do for you tonight is point you to verses 13 to 16, which speak of the bondage, the four generations of suffering, the 400 years of slavery, the long wait for deliverance, the failure to inherit the land in that time. And by the way, let's note just in passing that the cleansing of that land when the promise was fulfilled in the days of Joshua was not a matter of God's uncontrolled anger bursting out. Neither was it a matter of ethnic cleansing, as certain people will claim. Verse 16 tells us, doesn't it, that it was a matter of justice coming to ripeness after centuries of God's patience. We saw on Wednesday night that God's judgments in this world are not blind. They're not destructive aggression. They are measured justice from a holy and a merciful God. But back in closing to the seal of the covenant. In normal circumstances, a solemn covenant like this involving the carcasses of sacrificial animals would have to involve two parties. That's the whole point. Now, that is confirmed elsewhere in Scripture. Let me just read a verse to you. In Jeremiah 34, it says, The men who transgressed my covenant and did not keep the terms of the covenant which they made before me, I will make like the calf which they cut in two and passed between its parts. Now, that tells you how this was done. The animals were slain. Then their carcasses were divided so that there was a pathway down between it. Then the two parties to the covenant would go between the parts of the animal. And the penalty for breaking that covenant would be that whichever party broke faith would become like the beasts lying dead on the ground. They would be subject to death. You see the symbolism? If either party breaks faith, they shall become like the beasts. But God, knowing the weakness of Abram, and far more importantly, knowing our weakness, made Abram stand aside. 
and in the likenesses of smoke and fire. What do they speak to you of? The smoke and fire of Sinai, the cloud and the fiery pillar of of Exodus? I don't know. But God, in these two things, passes through alone. In other words, God is saying, whoever breaks covenant, the penalty will come upon me. Now, I don't want to suggest this directly to you, but let me just suggest it indirectly. Think of the Father and the Son in the Spirit. God the Father and God the Son passing through between these broken animals. And God is saying, I who am the Father will allow and cause my beloved son to pay the penalty of this covenant should you break it. Because you cannot pay that penalty, Abram. Because no son of Adam, no sinner can. God alone makes the covenant. God alone takes responsibility for its brokenness. This is why we began tonight by singing a paraphrase from Isaiah 53 which speaks of Jesus who bore our sins, who healed us through his own stripes, who died our death. Because here, my friends, once more, and very, very clearly, is the cross of Jesus Christ. We've called it tonight, from the beginning of our worship, an unfair exchange, because that's what it seems to us. Listen again. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. We sang to him earlier, Thou who wast rich, Beyond all splendor, all for love's sake, became as poor. Here is the great unfair exchange. Our sin which he bore for his sinlessness which he gave. Of course, Abram's faith must be focused on God and his promises. Is ours? Of course the promise of God must be sealed in the covenant because the covenant directs us to the cross. Are our promises sealed in that covenant of the cross? Are you sure? Not because of what you are. And not only because you believe. But are you sure because of him in whom you believe and trust that you are safe, saved, forgiven, traveling on with God, traveling on to God? 